my name's David Cole, it's Sunfield Pencil Dot Solutions uh, presentation on tools for effective water pollution prevention. Um, I'm hoping really from today that uh, it gets a bit of interest and probably uh, encourage you to read a few more of the guidance notes which I'm going to talk about. So let's get started. Um, so really, why is water pollution prevention necessary? Um, it's pretty obvious, but hopefully I'm going to bring that up today and give you a bit more of a, an insight into some of the problems that we've got in industry at the moment and what's driving change. Um, what is water pollution prevention? Again, hopefully we'll give you a little bit more insight into what actually is water pollution, the all, all the sorts of things that probably you guys design into your infrastructures all the time. And I, I want to put a bit of a bit of, sort of meat on the bones to what you're actually creating and doing and probably give you some new ideas that industry that we work with, specifically the manufacturing industry, the aerospace industry uh, and, and the food industry is looking for. Um, why should you be concerned about water pollution prevention? Well, thanks to things like the Blue Planet and David Attenborough, I, I finally think that people are starting to change their attitude. I think it's always been a little bit of a subject that nobody really cares about, not really, really thought about. And I think drainage engineers and, and people that are designing drainage engineers have suddenly, have suddenly been seeing that actually flooding and pollution is a massive effect on our economy and probably one of the most uh, important opportunities that we need to change and deal with right now. Um, what can be achieved through water pollution prevention? Well, most of the customers that I deal with and their big brand names is the one thing they do not need is a pollution incident. They don't want a prosecution and they don't want their name in the news. So the design is crucial. A little bit of an introduction to me. Um, so my name is David Cole. Um, I time served Craftsman for Ford Motor Company. That's my, my job. Um, and a little bit of a story, I've been there, I've worked there for a long time. In 1998, I invented a product called Envirovalve, which is a a bladder system for blocking drains. What I noticed that Fords, like most of the companies, when there's a pollution incident, everybody goes to panic mode. They start throwing spill kits and products to try and soak up spills. And my idea was purely, well, if I stop it using the drainage network, I've got a, an immediate catchment point where I can suck it out of, I can send it back and get it reused. And at the site that I worked at for, for Fords in Leamington Spa, I was sadly no longer with us. Um, we virtually eliminated the use of spill kits for any major spills a really significant change because when you use spill kits for spills, you're actually sending that material to a landfill for a has waste landfill. You're not actually getting rid of the spill, you're just moving it somewhere else. Um, and then in 2006, after quite a lot of discussions with the Environment Agency, who were kind of a bit against my ideas because they're well entrenched with the spill response sector, was to, to actually develop a product for the fire brigade, which is called Drain Block. The fire brigade use it now. If there's a fire and a site doesn't have the ability to isolate a drainage system, they actually use that piece of kit to block the drain to stop the fire water as best they can. As, you know, it's just a sort of a, a stop gap, a reactive product. That was developed after several fire people in, in London had um, near miss accidents where they were trying to climb down into drains to put bungs into drains while there was chemical spills flowing through the drains. What a lot of people don't know in the public is that the Environment Agency actually funds the fire service for all of its, its pollution response equipment. So it's a significant one for me, really, was it sort of like brought me into the high, uh, into, to, to highlight, really, my skills. I've won quite a few awards for my valves, so it's a little bit I've done with the fuel industry, etc. just the designs of containment valves, which is really my main area. As I always say to me, what's what I'm best at? Blocking drains, that's what I do. Um, and I suppose really that helped me was that the Environment Agency asked me to sit on the, um, the, the committee and act, act as launch speaker for Syria 736, which was written in 2012, which was probably my sort of highlight, and has pushed me up the sort of scale, really, so people like yourselves probably now uh, want to listen to some of the things I have to say. So, you know, pat ourselves on the back now. These are some of our customers that we currently deal with. In 1998, when Envirovalve was totally objected, uh, rejected by the Environment Agency, spill responses, clean it up. Nothing about containment was really ever really there, really, really thought of. I think the flood industry has grown that as well because the demand for people to say, what happens, where does water go, how do we control it? So in, in, in sort of 2004 and prior to that, you had a guidance called Syria 164. This was written for the coma industry and it's all about containing spills. It's all about bungs, basically, that's it. Um, then a driver happened, Bunsfield explosion. 2005. This drove the drove a major pollution incident, a major loss of control. This was kind of a driver for me. Syria 736. EA said, 
this is no good. I mean, it took, look at the distance, 2014 before we launched that document from 2005. It took that long to get the funding and then for people like ourselves to be sat together to create and write a new guidance, which is absolutely critical now to all businesses in pollution control. And then the sentencing guidelines, which I think is probably one of the most important drivers that's come in 2014-15. You will get prosecuted if you commit a crime and that's pollution. Pollution is a crime. And that's the one that's probably driving industry to actually start to spend more money and invest more energy into the design of drainage and pollution containment. Um, I missed one there. There's also the fire um, guidance, which was brought out in 2015. That's because the waste industry cannot control fire water runoff and they keep having fires and they've, 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 they've marked their card. So the Environment Agency actually introduced a guidance specifically for all those industries that are permitted. So I'm going to go a little bit what we had before. We had Syria 164, which I'm quite sure that you will be aware of and you probably have used in, in, in the past. What Syria 164 was really was, it applied really just to the comb site industry. Um, it's all about bunding and how to build buns. It sticks in there about sticking pen stop valves at the end of the lines. I think you've got for the waste industry, the, the wish guidance, which again mentions pen stop valves. So it's actually telling people sites, thousands of sites, fit a pen stop valve, that's for your containment, fit a bund around your tanks, that's your tank. Pretty basic stuff. You had to play for it. It's really something that only the construction industry and probably guys like yourselves would be would be open to that document. No customer really ever picked up that guidance. Certainly no food manufacturing site or or a warehouse company. They just wouldn't have looked at that guidance. So what we had was we had Bunsfield. Bunsfield is um, the biggest explosion since World War Two uh, in Europe, um, and it, it, it's a it's immense. It's a complete disaster. What you can see about photographs, you've probably seen it. We've got a big ash cloud. So you've now got Cobra actually meeting on the Sunday, deciding, you know, sorry, on the on the Monday night, I think it was on a Tuesday. Um, what are we going to do about this ash cloud? Because this is going over to, to, to France. What are we going to do? And there was a, a real major, major, major issue that, that nobody really knew what would happen. This is a total disaster, the worst that we've had. Um, but the water pollution event that actually uh, occurred from that event is probably, most people don't really aware of it. We lost water abstraction points forever from that site. And the damage was done um, that, that has basically cost the taxpayer billions. The impact on that is huge, but nobody really, really got into that. But that was the driver, to be honest, the water pollution incident was the driver from the EA to say, we need to write a new guidance here because if a coma site at top tier with the money they have to develop a design doesn't work, what are the rest of the companies doing around the country? What have they developed? Because they're all telling us they have pollution containment sewn up. But have they? Because if this site couldn't do it, what would a what would a, a, a dairy do? What would a food plant do? What would an airport? What would a nuclear industry do? Um, and the legacy from this is that really we can't do it again. We need to change our designs. Um, sad thing is, I don't not quite so sure everybody understood it and is even bothered to pick up the guidance and read it. So series seven three six, two years of my life working on this really, uh, in and out of meetings. And it's a really, really important document because it's a complete change. So what we've done here is we've created a document that I hope, um, you know, that you guys have actually read it. If you haven't, I'm hoping from at least today you want to pick it up and read it. Uh, and I'm always there as one of the launch speakers to it. I put a lot of effort into this. Is If you ask me a question, I'll tell you where to go and look and whereabouts to read about it. My area of expertise is the tertiary, which I think a lot of drainage people uh, and, and, and flood modelers will understand. Because this, to me, is the most significant point, because that's where pollution comes from. It doesn't come from the bund, it doesn't come from the primary, it comes from the tertiary, because that's the bit that dumps it into the river or dumps it into the ground. So this guidance must be universally applicable and accessible. So in other words, the EA made it free, so anybody can read it, and it's a universally applicable to every single business. They're not even saying it's for factories, manufacturing plants. This is for warehouses. This is for shops like Tesco's. This is for people who, if you have a fire, Where's your runoff go? So this is this guidance is driving more to knowledge to give customers more information. And that was part of our game was educated customers. If we've got educated customers that can ask the question of designers or product manufacturers, people who are delivering equipment, you get the right answers. If you just say, oh, that'll be OK, you can just design my site as you've done before, you'll get good information, bad information in, bad information out. And that's exactly what we were trying to avoid. Um, the best part of Syria is it starts to look at understanding risk and it starts to direct customers to say, does your design work? 
and do you know it works? And I think there's there's tools within the guidance. Again, I've not really got time today to go into the focus of them, but there's tools within the guidance that I'll go through in a minute that actually do this do this for the customer and allow people like ourselves, yourselves, to deliver really good systems and really good solutions and actually show it. Um, and updated technology. Stop for fitting penstock valves because we don't even have them in the guidance. The word's gone because what the penstock does is it allows the buyer to generically select the cheapest possible penstock valve he can find. So you find terminology coming in, which is there now as pollution containment device. You've got the spill modeling that I'm going to talk about in a minute. There's little bits of technology that got dropped into the guidance, which is to direct to direct the designers and also the customers to start asking questions. Does the system I'm buying, does my solution actually work and can you prove it? Um, so one of my big bugbears, and I don't want to go too much, but it does bug me, is the penstock valve. The penstock valve, as you can see in this little image here, what we come across a lot, we do a lot of servicing for the sites. They've got penstocks everywhere. They're not actually fit for purpose that they actually installed them for. They've installed a flow control device, quite relatively slow, used by the water industry, fantastic product, brilliant. But what it actually does is it doesn't stop flow completely. It's got a leak rate. It's actually built to a British standard, EN standard leak rate. So when these sites operate these valves for containment, they actually get bypassed. And if you look at the guidance, the Syria guidance I've just mentioned, there's some of my case studies within it, which you're more than happy to ask me about, and I'll point you to, where customers have had penstock valves closed, they've got them, and the cyanide still went in the river and killed all the fish and got them prosecuted. So what we have is a lot of products that have been installed over the years, hundreds, thousands, that are not actually fit for purpose. The operability is slow, and a pollution valve needs to, needs to close instantly. So the minute I press a button to say close that valve, that valve should be shut within three, five seconds, because these are on sites that are manufacturing plants. They could have just lost maybe a thousand litres of cyanide. It's very small. It's only going to flow down that drain. They need to shut it and hold it as fast as they can. Um, maintenance issues. Big, we deal with these a lot. This one here is quite nice in this image. But when that's down into a chamber and somebody's put a biscuit over the top and you've got a 600 mil valve with a 600 mil frame uh, manhole cover, we can't actually get that valve out without completely removing the biscuit. And maintenance of these pieces of equipment is just almost, they go up and down. We could adjust the stops, but if there's a major overhaul to do, the site's going to be built for thousands of pounds. We've got a civils project. We've got to actually lift the biscuit and get these crap, these valves out. They weigh tons, some of them. Um, and poor monitoring. We do a lot of our equipment into monitoring. Because these have a tendency to use mains power, and where you normally want pollution containment valves is you haven't got mains power, is there's a bit of a break in the, in the link. So what we have a tendency to do is it's easier to use basic monitoring, end to end controls, ping it out to one of our valves, which is in the middle of the field with a solar panel on it, and we can control massive sites with quite simple technology. And, and I find the penstock valves is very slow and cumbersome and always needs um, power, mains power. Um, I mentioned about sensing guidelines. This is a really important area for all of us, including my business, because we're delivering, we're actually delivering a product. And I, I'm assuming for a lot of you guys, because you're delivering a service, a consultative service, a design service to customers. And it's changed. And in 2014, 15, it changed with the environmental sensing guidelines. And they've had a massive impact on, on businesses. Most of the companies that we now deal with, if we walk into site and say, what's your problem? It's fire water containment. What's the driver? sentencing guidelines because now what you've got is a punishment so there's no more oh you you know i don't know multinational company kills a load of fish and gets fined the same as a small little tea shop down the road it's based on the group turnover of company so your fine is based on the size of your business your pockets it's got to be a deterrent so in other words it's going to hurt uh, and it's got to remove any financial gain so there can't be a financial gain of avoiding doing good pollution containment it has to be that as a business you've got the funds, you should be doing the best you can to support that business. You see the little thing there, Thames, Thames Water, sorry, excuse me, Thames Water, 20 million pound fine. Previous to that, their biggest fine was a million pounds. The same year, Tesco's, quite a small oil spill really, eight million pounds. It's significant because it's changed the way it looks. When you got fined 5,000 pounds, nobody really cared. It didn't hurt. When it's 20 million pounds, somebody starts to ask a question. So this is this is an area that I hope is really interesting. Um, spill mapping, which is is something that we developed from Syria, Bunsfield. We don't know what would happen when they operated their system. They didn't know their valves would work. So what happened was from that is 
we need to understand risk. And you can actually read a little bit about this in the guidance on page 136, which is actually the site that's the little animation on the side. So you understand the risk by animation. This is micro drainage and good topography and good understanding of what a site looks like. And taking the guidance notes at section 433, we actually give you a one in 10 year rainstorm event, loss of all your stock and firefighting materials. So you now create a volume. We even give you the rain chart um, to, to, to work from. And once you've got that, you're able to actually animate that 24 hour disaster. And that's key because that's what customers are trying to create. So it empowers then that you create this little animation, which I'll run on the side there. You just see it running now. So this is a site. They've got a pollution containment valve. The pollution containment valve is there. And what they've done is they've installed that pollution containment valve and now they want to prove that it actually works. This animation actually shows that the pollution valve is in the wrong place. The overflow goes into the river, through the staff car park. The whole design is actually a pointless exercise. But that empowered them now to make the change, which what they did was they moved the valve to here, which actually puts the containment within this area here and saves, saves actually the pollution event. Same event, but following the, the very simple guidance that you've got in the guidelines. It reduces costs enormously, makes, makes you guys and us look great because we're actually showing them what the problem is, the amount of the problem. And also, if you put that animation in front of the environment agency, they will be more satisfied with permits than going through reams and reams of arguments about how are you controlling this, how you can, because you can actually evidence that the design you've put, the design of the drainage that's been done, the design of the attenuation system that you might have used works. So it answers nearly all the questions and it's in the guidance. And by using the guidance, you're using the best practice that's been written so far. It satisfies almost everybody who's involved in the process. So toggle block, a um, bit of a simple image here, but please go on our website and have a look at it. Toggle block is purpose designed for pollution containment. It's not a flow control device. It's got one, one job, and that is to stop flow. By stopping a flow, we then can create that, that, that model that you've just seen in the spill model. That's its job. Um, operability, we make it M to M. We make it radio control. We put it as push buttons. The idea is it can go anywhere. It fits anywhere. It's self-contained so that it's not actually not putting any services to it. You're actually saying, here's a valve. It's got a box, a little box with all its controllers in it. It's got its own compressor in it uses pneumatic air, only has pneumatics when it operates, closed and open, goes back to sleep then, tells you that it's closed uh, and operated, so it's very adaptable. We stick these into fire alarm systems, we stick them into all sorts of stuff. I mean, local to where your, head, your office is in Cambridge, we've got them all on the Cambridge airfield there, so where you've got the attenuation ponds, we monitor their, their um, ponds. If they have a pollution incident, the valve they simply shut and fill the ponds up. That's, that's just how they work, and they also work off the control tower if there's a, an aircraft crash. Um, and, and, and it's probably worth going to our website, just have a little bit of a look at some of the stuff we've done. And if you needed to ask any sort of technical questions or require any drawings, just ask away and we'll, we'll get there. Maintenance is great because they're light, they're simple, they're modular. You can see there with the little split pins. We can take them apart, we can bring them to the surface, we can clean them, we can put them back together. The heaviest part is a plate, the main plate that bolts the wall. If you imagine fitting a hydro brake, it's the same effect really. It's creating a flat, flat face, though we do do retrofit. Um, so it's very simple, you get a flat face, that place is never ever going to come out. That's the heaviest thing that can go in and that's probably a maximum weight of about 40 kilos. Um, and future proof. And for the first time they've actually realised, because Highways England is responsible now for its own pollution, so if there's a pollution incident under the environmental sensing guidelines, they will be prosecuted and fined. And they don't have state um, crown immunity anymore. Is that why we've been fitting toggle um, penstock valves when nobody can ever operate them because they're manual. They don't actually know where they are half the time. And when you have an RTA, you're not actually going to get to them to actually be able to operate them. So what we're looking at on that particular section, the first section ever, they will be controlled by the street lighting controls. So in the event of a, an incident on the Albury Viaduct, I think there's about 15 valves in total on that length at Albury, is that they can isolate all those valves remotely. So they'll be, they'll be able to control them from a remote control station. So in the event of an incident, the drainage can be closed, which means they can wash down faster because they can clean out, take, remove the, the materials from the drown, down, downstream drainage, actually where the valve is. So the idea is, is to speed up the reactive of a, a pollution incident. At the moment, they're more panicking about when well, we need to keep it out. Actually, these valves can shut almost instantly, hold the drainage, wash the sides out, and then just open up again. It's a really smart idea, and to be honest, when, when you do look at the principle of the penstock valve, the PCD device that are all over all the motorways, you just go ask yourself, how would they actually work in an incident?
So we do a little bit of monitoring. So I've, I've nearly finished now, so you're okay. This is really key. Is businesses are now linking monitoring to vowels, and that's what we're making this adaptability for, is that we need to put our vowels maybe in the middle of nowhere, because they're normally at the end of a site on a grass verge where there's no power. But if we could link by M to M, which is what we do do, we can almost link to any device, fire alarm, pH alarms, interceptor alarms, anything to trigger the valve to give you that final shot. All we're really trying to do is we need to stop a flow instantly. And then the next part is, is to understand if you stop that flow, we have fire or pollution. What does the site look like? Does it have the capacity to store a pollution incident or a fire water incident before it escapes the site and causes a pollution incident? So I brought out a guide. Um, this is like a free download guide. It's more in my words, so it's more, um, I hope, hopefully a little bit more simpler. A lot of the companies I deal with use this because it helps them because some of the technical to speak in the in the guides that can sort of get a bit lost, especially if you haven't, got, you know, haven't been doing it as a, a, for 20, 25, 30 years as I have. So I've, I've brought that out. You're quite welcome to download that. It's a, it's a simple thing on our website. Just go to the link. Um, that's my email. If you want to ask me a question about something, there's a project you're looking at or you want to ask, I will always try to give you the right advice as I see it in the guidance um, to help. Uh, it's no skin off my nose because I'm trying to help because I don't want water pollution to me is uh, every time I see a pollution incident, it's, it's a failure really. Um, but one of the things I do see every day is there are designs in place for sites that have invested a considerable amount of money in pollution containment that would not work. And that, that to me is something I want to change. And I think if we just keep educating ourselves, and this booklet is good, the guidance series 736, please download a copy of it or ask me to send you a, a PDF of it because it's a really good guidance bit of bedtime reading, but will certainly help you in, in anything you do, really, especially in this area, because it's only going to grow. There's our phone number, and um, there's our website. So, uh, you know, thanks for thanks for listening. I hope I wasn't too boring, but um, I hope it was a value.